Okay, thank you very much everybody for coming along. Um, this is a panel debate on is inclusion working? Um, my name's Nancy Gedge and I am until this evening the TES Blogger of the Year for 2015. <laughs> um, so I have about three hours left to wear my crown and I write mostly around issues of inclusion. I write um, from the perspective of a teacher and a parent, so I have quite a lot of interest in this area. And I'm very, very pleased to introduce to you my four panellists who've all agreed to come along and share their perspectives as well. Um, so I'm just going to introduce, you, introduce their names and then I'm going to let them tell you which phase they're from and where they sit in the school hierarchy, because I'm hoping that those details will give us um, in, in insight into their insights. So if I explain for me, I'm a mainstream primary school teacher. Then we have Jules Dorby over there. Jules, do you want to say who you are? Hello. Yes, I'm now working in a secondary school, a big comprehensive with a speech and language base and a physical disability base within that comprehensive at Thomas Hardy School in Dorchester. Um, I'm lead of the speech and language base. I also run a as Dan course, which is a, an option if they don't choose a GCSE, and I do whole school literacy. Okay, and thank you, Jules. My next um, panelist is Andrew Smith, otherwise known as Old Andrew. Do you want to introduce yourself, Andrew? Hi, I'm um, Andrew. I'm a secondary maths teacher. Uh, my real, my only real qualification to talk on SEM beyond um, classroom teaching is that I did a master's dissertation on SEM policy. So if you see me suddenly rifling through uh, a red book, that's my dissertation looking for <laughs> all the facts that I, I knew then and have forgotten since. OK, thank you, Andrew. Um, my next panellist is Rob Webster. So, Rob, if you'd like to, uh, otherwise known as Maximising TAs, do you want to explain who, who you are and what you do? Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm a researcher at the uh, UCL Institute of Education. I've um, been there about 11 years now. Uh, and part of the, the work that I've been doing is a longitudinal study on the uh, experiences of children with statements of SEN in, uh, in, in, well, in primary and secondary mainstream settings, which is something of a, um, kind of a, a, a unique uh, um, study in the, in the educational world. Uh, I, in, a, in a previous life, um, I, I was a teaching assistant in schools for about five years, uh, and I've also worked as a SEN officer in, um, uh, in, in the local authorities. I have some experience of the statutory assessment system. Uh, I should also point out, I think Rob's being a little bit modest, um, Rob's one of the researchers and authors of the DIS report, if you've read that or heard of that, so yeah, so I thought I'd let you know that. He, yeah. And finally, um, I suppose, what, well this is um, Brian Walton, otherwise known on Twitter if you follow Old Primary Head, um, so Brian if you'd like to explain what you do. Um. <laughs> I can't use these things. Um, I'm a head teacher. I've been a head teacher for 12 years. I'm in my fourth school. Um, and in particular, my interest here is my, my recent school, where I've been for two years, is a mainstream primary, but with specialist provision on site as part of the same school. So we actually, from all over Somerset, take children from specialist. Um, so my interest in, inclu in inclusion has particularly come from that area over the last two years. Okay, so I hope you'll see we've, uh, we've tried to put together uh, a really interesting panel, people with lots of different views. But the thing that holds us all together is that we really care about the education of the children and young people of this country. So we're going to have a look and see what our different experiences are and how we answer these questions. So my first question um, for you all, I suppose, is to set the scene, really. It's a very nebulous concept, inclusion. It's really difficult to pin it down. What does inclusion mean to you? So when you talk about inclusion, what do you mean by it? Do you want to start, Brian? I'll <laughs> we'll start. go that way. Um, this, is, this is a difficult one for me. I don't like the word inclusion, um, particularly now that we're in a, I'm in a specialist setting. My experience is, is quite often exclusion. Many of the children we get have been excluded from mainstream schools. Um, and that's not just, I really want to make sure the debate here isn't just around behaviour. It, it, they're excluded from mainstream schools, quite often not because of behaviour. Um, for me, I, it's a very personal journey. Um, I have, it's a very large school that we're part of, the 600 pupils, from 0 to 11. So we have 25 babies at the moment. 
Um, our raise online, last year we had eight children in specialist who were year six, many in the P levels, kind of low, low P4, P5. They're on my raise online. Every, all eight of those children. Um, my parent view looks terrible. If you go to my raise online, it's full of blue. If you go to my parent view, it looks like my school is really underachieving um, because uh, you know those children are included into the test regime. And, and I think that is an absolute outrage because those children have made incredible progress. Um, in fact, they, you know, I've, I've kind of got three levels of assessment, which is not achieving where you should be, achieving where you should be, and made shitloads of progress. They've made shitloads, um, you know, but that's never recognised ever by any government person or any piece of paper or any policy at all. And I think that's a real shame because it misses out actually how much progress children and specialists can make. And we never quite get that conversation going on. So that's my kind of perspective. Uh, a bit okay, really. do you want to pass it on to Rob? Cheers. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I, I suppose I started looking at this issue about 16, 17 years ago part of the, the end of my undergraduate degree um, and I've I, I'm still not sure actually I st I'm, I'm not even I'm becoming convinced that inclusion is is not even quite the right term for the thing that might be in my head you know it's a bit like Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys you know he could he kind of hear it in his head but he couldn't kind of get it out uh, uh, on onto music um, I I, th I mean, to give you a kind of technical answer, um, and I wrote it down, sorry, so apologies if I kind of uh, read this, but I think it's the, it's, it has something to do with the principle and the processes by which schools value and respond to the needs of individual learners and gives consideration to the structures and the components of learning and access arrangements. So things around, it's, it's to do with things around curriculum, teaching, assessment procedures, the environment, the opportunities for social experiences, but it's much, much bigger than that. You know, we're talking about it in terms of SEN, but actually when we talk about inclusion, we're talking about everybody, everybody. Uh, you know, there's no exceptions. There were two things in my mind when I woke up this morning at five to six. One of them was today, doing this, about inclusion, and the other thing was the referendum. Sorry to mention, I have had enough, about it, or the neverendum, as I've heard it being called. Um, but the, when the first thing, when I put the two things together in my head, it just felt today like the vision of inclusion has just gone a few hundred yards out of reach today. Um, so I'm, that's why I'm wearing black. Uh, so <laughs> I, shall, um, I shall pass over to Andrew. Okay, we'll pass tissues round later. Okay, Andrew, would you like to answer, have a go your answer? What does inclusion mean to you? Well, um, it means about a half of my dissertation um, which looked at all the documents on on inclusion and concluded that no one knew what it meant um, when I got here last night I spoke I, uh, several people asked me what I'd be speaking on um, and I said inclusion and e everyone responded with something different because it meant mm -hmm. something different the first person I spoke to was involved in apprenticeships and talked about um, having a varied curriculum and was quite surprised when I said, well, usually it's to do with special needs. And he hadn't realised that. He saw it as to do with a comprehensive curriculum. Um, another person I spoke to when I said it was inclusion said that their son was at a special school and they could not imagine them at a mainstream school and just immediately assumed it meant mainstreaming or integration, um, which is the meaning that for most of my career was a do ha has been the dominant one that the sort of from the late 90s onwards um until about 2007 the policy was to run down special schools and force people whether they wanted to or not into mainstream and that was called inclusion and then the third person i spoke to was involved in writing cu um, curriculums and they said that they would be asked when they wrote a curriculum that well who would be able to access it uh, uh, who wouldn't be able to access the curriculum and they'd be told that there were just some kids could not do any kind of academic curriculum and if they didn't immediately ask then the next thing they know is a third of kids would be ruled out of an academic education whereas if they asked straight away at that point how many students do you mean it tended to be you know less than half half a percent in any given school. And I think that's the, the final definition of inclusion, is some kind of ongoing ideological process to adjust the curriculum to fit students, often with another agenda behind it. OK, thank you. And Jules? Thank you. Um, inclusion to me means choice. 
I've worked with parents who have gone to tribunals to try and get their child with Down syndrome into a comprehensive school, mainstream school. I've also worked with parents who've gone to tribunals to get their child into a special school. So I think choice for the student and the parent is really important. I think that's often forgotten. Um, there also needs to be an attitude. I would say it's an attitude rather than a differentiated worksheet. And I think a celebration of diversity, the fact that it's not always a problem to include students, particularly um, we're concentrating on SEN here. And I often say as well, I think it's about asking the why, if there are problems and difficulties, rather than saying inclusion's not working, it's why isn't it working and what are we going to do about it? So I'd really like the debate to open up on inclusion, that it's not necessarily problematic. Okay, thank you. Um, so I hope that's clear for everybody. I'm going to check my next question. So um, I'll ask for a volunteer to start with this next question. Um, so I've been thinking about inclusion as, as, from my perspective, being not quite how I hoped it would be. What do you feel are the main barriers to effective inclusion? And so what I'm trying to get at is, what is it that makes inclusion unsuccessful? If we can identify what those things are, then we can perhaps get rid of those. So it works. Jules, do you want to go first? I'll start again. Sorry, listen to me again. Um, the I, for me, effective inclusion, um, what makes it unsuccessful is the first question you've got to ask yourself. If it's effective, it should be successful. So um, for me, it could be lower expectations. Um, it could be low aspirations. Corridor teaching makes it unsuccessful. TAs having responsibility rather than the teacher. They should be there to empower the child, but the teacher should, quality first teaching and the teacher having full responsibility for that child makes it successful, so that can be a barrier. Um, and the increasing uniformity of schools at the moment, I'm in a, in a mainstream curriculum and we're, it's becoming harder and harder for the students I teach and work with to succeed in school at the moment. GCSEs are becoming harder, the idea is they're more rigorous, um, with the idea being that everyone's going to get cleverer, everyone's going to achieve, it's not necessarily the case. Um, and particularly these terminal exams that have come up. We used to do a BTEC science, that's gone because it's now exams, so they may as well do GCSE. We used to do BTEC sport, that's gone. It used to be 60% physical, 40% theory. From next year, it's 40% physical, 60% theory. And the head of PE told me yesterday that it's possible now to do an A-level in physical education without doing any physical education. So it's so much more about theory. So the uniformity, the fact we want all our children to be the same, and the structure of a mainstream school, that's becoming very difficult for us in mainstream to include all our children. Okay, Brian's volunteering to go next. So Brian, what gets in the way of effective... effective Are there any year six here? teachers in here, by any chance? <laughs> No, okay. No, I am sort of. Okay. <laughs> um, I think fear. Uh, uh, you know, as a head teacher, um, I have, and I do a lot of work with other head teachers, I can't count the number of head teachers that have gone, that are no longer with me over, the, over about the, the last six years that I've been a consultant working with head teachers. Um, and they're usually going because their schools are not working. But the, the way we judge how schools work and do not work are, is very, very narrow, as we know. Do, you know, we could talk about, we're not talking about Ofsted here at the moment. We're not talking about the system that's changed, the new curriculum. If you're a year six teacher right now and you're doing your moderation, you will realise how tight that is. The idea, therefore, that you have um, issues in your school that are far more challenging and far more complex than a very easily to measure system starts to give fear. And I think a lot of head teachers. And that has changed. When I say head teachers now, we're talking about mats, we're talking about organisations, we're talking about a very different world as well. The fear that comes into that, I think, is really impacting upon what could be an inclusion. You know, I feel very strongly that if, as, as a parent, I would like my child to go to their local school, more and more I've sat on panels, particularly where children have been excluded, where the head teachers are saying, we cannot meet your needs. And it is as simple as that. You know, the head teachers are saying, we cannot meet your needs to those parents. They have a choice, but the school is saying, we cannot meet your needs. Why are, th why are we saying that? You know, is it because we can't cope? Is it the, the, the line that children's behaviours and needs are more complex than they've ever been? I don't believe they are. 
Um, I, but I do believe the system's got to a point where actually I can say that in the panel, we can meet your needs. And then I have, as a head, said that. I have said, I don't think we have the capacity. You know, in our school at the moment with 650 pupils, it is not in the best interest of, of some autistic children to join our very, very busy site. But quite often it's, we cannot meet your needs. And I think it's fear-based quite often. Okay, That's thank a personal you, opinion. Who wants to go next? Go on then, Rob. Um, I, I began by saying that I wasn't quite sure what inclusion was, and I, th I think um, I think I'm quite, I'm a bit more secure on what I think it isn't. I think it's these kind of weaker forms of inclusion, and Jules hit on a couple of them. So it's these kind of you know forms of assimilation. You know, in so you know, we will. Uh, you know, we'll kind of host uh, a, a, children, a child with SCN in a mainstream setting, and yet they're still somewhat removed from what's going on. And I've s kind of seen that in the research that we've done, and I've kind of characterised it as being in the class but not of the class. Uh, that, for me, isn't effective inclusion. Um, neither is it um, these kind of, uh, you know, you have these inclusion units in schools, but that's actually just another... Uh, form of in, you know, internal segregation, um, quite often something to do, quite often something to do with behaviour, um, and anything that's kind of just watered down, really, that might be sort of posing as something else, you know, like sort of lower expectations, lower challenge, um, really kind of, uh, well, sometimes got, uh, called differentiation, um, and a kind of sense of, you know, killing with kindness, really, and I've kind of seen that in the the way in which schools can use teaching assistance um, to support to support children and actually there is a, a kind of um, I don't know maybe being a, bit, being a bit too controversial too early but the um, <laughs> the kind of what, what it, Rob, the allowed. kind of or bless you know or bless approach to you know let's try and make this child's education as kind of nice and safe as possible and just kind of keep the you know because we don't think they'll be able to handle the challenge and I know that that comes from a well-intentioned place um, but I think, uh, and I know there are all kinds of pressures on, on why that might 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 be the case. Um, but I just, I, as I say, weaker forms of of, of, of inclusion, I think, are, are something of a of a threat. I actually think you're being too nice there, Rob. I'm, I'm naturally very you're nice. Being, it's being very nice about that. I would jump right off that fence and say, <laughs> all bless has no place in a in a, a school teaching children with special needs at all. At all. So. Mm -hmm. Andrew, your turn. <coughs> so um, I think the first thing, well, sorry, I should say, having said that I don't find inclusion a particularly meaningful term, that to be asked about inclusion, I'm then sort of stuck on it. But I, I talk more generally just SEN policy, what makes it work yeah. and what makes it fail. I think, firstly, there's a conf there's a, a real conflict at the centre of it about the aim of SEN policy. Um, that on the one hand, it's about getting resources to particular students and in order to do that there is constant pressure to label students, to diagnose them, to say this is exactly what they need, this is what they must have, this is what we've identified about them and at the same time there's also a constant pressure to avoid stigma and to say oh they should be with other students, they're not much different, um, we don't want to make them feel different, we don't want to single them out. So you have these two pressures, one to emphasise difference and one to emphasize uh, uh, that there isn't a difference and the policy just switches one way or the other often without ev even explicitly saying the policy's changed a lot of policy documents over the last 40 years have said oh we're just reiterating what the last policy said and then reinterpreted it to mean something else so there's always this policy problem i think on a, a very practical level there's a problem of snake oil um it's not always obvious what can be done to help a student with their, with SEN. Um, I, I, the worst of the snake oil, I think, is what is when desperate um, parents are exploited. I mean, if you look up things like facilitate communication or wobble boards or just ridiculous things that do not work, have been proven not to work, and people are still preying on parents saying, this is the cure. Um, to your son's dyslexia or your daughter's autism or whatever. Um, I think that's a huge problem. And I think schools are guilty uh, in, of joining in with that. I, I mean, even well, actually, government is guilty of joining in with that. There have been document. There was a, at least one um, circular on dealing with dyslexia that had the pictures of wobble boards in. Um, I think 
there's also just the, once the money had been devolved to schools um, and the, the pressure to to get more to mainstream students was there, there was this feeling: well, we should be doing something. This is something we better do it. And then you were, so a lot of time has been spent use it doing paperwork to prove you're doing something. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of recrimination afterwards to, to cast doubt on um, whether it actually made any difference. And I mean, the way TAs were used is one thing in particular where it was the method for help supporting students. And then suddenly, it, it, po it was pointed out that actually the you know the ev the statistical evidence of the good TAs do um, it's not there. You you have to use them in particular ways. You can't just say there's a TA in that class that that's dealt with. Um, the other part that I think is wasted expertise, I mean, I've talked about the fads and fashions and the nonsense in schools, but there's a lot of real expertise on SEM, particularly in the special schools. And when inclusion was the main aim, that wasn't being made use of. I mean, it, the idea was that any teacher is a teacher of SEN and everyone was expected to have some idea about any um, special need they might encounter. Now, it's one thing to say, to train students, uh, sorry, to train teachers to look up information, but a lot of it was just the worst inset, the worst ideas. Um, from the height of inclusion, one thing I remember was a stu was a boy that used to swear at teachers every so often, and I remember seeing an I IEP saying suspected Tourette's, except it wasn't actually spelt correctly. They just the the uh, the, per the head of year had heard that children with Tourette's swear. And they just decided to guess that as a diagnosis, which is absolute nonsense. Just, right. it's not how it works. And I think the final thing is um, too much emphasis on behaviour as as a special need. Uh, obviously, some kinds of behaviour do show a special need, but you can't simply say a child's misbehaving; they must need something. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm going to skip. Nancy, can I just respond? Sorry, have we got time to just quickly respond to the snake oil? Can particularly? I put you on a timer, Jules? Yeah, put me on a timer. How, How long have I got? Like? I'll give you three hours. That's fine. <laughs> <Two minutes. laughs> no, I just want to say on the snake oil. I, I mean, Andrew's right that there is SCN is the area where um, the learning styles, the snake oil, the wobble balls has come from, but. In its defence, I have a wobble board and I'm rubbish at it, so I'm not saying, but it has come through. I've inherited it from my job. Um, but in its defence, I think what happens with SEM, particularly in mainstream, we're dealing with the, the so few students that I've been working in education and SEM for 20 years, and I'm st I've got a student now that I've never seen before. I don't know what to do. You know, there's certain different things about him. He's causing us a lot of concern and but we are it is working but I'm doing stuff that I've never done before I'm looking up stuff I've never done before there is no research on this one child in a mainstream school in my school so to a certain extent you need to be quite creative in how you do this but the creativity must come from research it needs to be it needs to be cemented in research but you do sometimes have to break the rules um, you know He's he's helping the site team put out chairs one lesson a week. Um, that seems to be working. There's no research <laughs> for that, you know. So sometimes you need to be creative, and I think that's where the problem lies. But I do I do recognise Andrew's point on snake oil. There might be some research, Jules, occupational therapy. You know, there might be. Well, hev heavy muscle. Yeah. I mean, Andrew yeah. might. So, but the the idea he's putting chairs out because we know a child with autism actually does uh, sensory integration is around heavy muscle. Yeah. But uh, he'll probably look that up now. <laughs> <and tell me. laughs> so yeah, but there is some research. But you know, putting chairs out isn't in that research. Okay, um, I'm going to skip a question now because I want I really like to get to the idea of what whether inclusion means we have to all have all children in the same school does inclusion mean that did it ever mean that does it mean that now so who wants to go first right okay brian well i've kind of said it in some ways um it, one of the wonderful things about our school because it, it, it is a large school we have children in our specialist provision whose brothers and sisters are in the school in the mainstream school so christmas performances parents evenings all of those kind of things work side by side um and the parents have chosen that that is their choice um, but I've also said, on the other hand, that I am now saying no to high-end autistic children because I think 650 children in our site has, and with our evidence and our research has shown that it has been stressful for some of those children. Um, so I, this is this is the thing. I, that it, there is no one obvious answer to it. What was the question again? 
<laughs> Do children all have to go to the yeah, same okay. school? Um, I don't think there's a, a one obvious answer to that because if some of our children have very complex medical needs, if we do not have the needs to meet their medical needs, I would be the first to say to a parent, hey, go, go elsewhere. But I think as a first point of call, wouldn't it be fantastic that if you had a child, you could go to your child's local school and you were happy for that experience? Um, so yes and no, really. I think I think there are times when it's That's definitely That's a classic no. inclusion answer. Yeah, yes and no. Uh, yeah. Okay, Rob, what do you think? Um, I, I suppose if this if this is in part a question about um, should we or shouldn't we have special schools? I think my my view on that is as long as there is a um, a need for and a place for for special schools, I think that's how we should maintain it. I think to do anything else might would go against. Um, the kind of notion of parental um, parental choice, whatever that means these days, I'm not quite sure. Um, I think I think it's interesting to look at the reasons why parents um, prefer special schools um, in in certain circumstances. One of the research projects I was involved in, we looked at uh, f about 50 kids who had statements, and they were all in year five, and we talked to their parents. Uh, about transition, what thoughts were in their mind about transition, given that they were, you know, a year or a year away from moving school, um, and the parents that we spoke to, it was very revealing that none of them really gave educational reasons. It was uh, there were mostly kind of social reasons to do with, um, I don't think my child is going to cope in a really large school with uh, you know, 1,500 kids and a massive campus, and uh, you know get lost and issues around bullying and peer relations and you know, possibly falling in with the wrong crowd. And I think we, we probably need to explore those um, reasons a little bit more um, and how we kind of might sort of mitigate some of those and deal with and uh, uh, address some of those anxieties. Um, just to kind of you know, tr try to sort of avoid just sending school uh, children to, to special schools because it's mo somehow more convenient for, for them and, and everybody else. So, um, I've got your slide up behind you. So oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, th th this actually is um, a point about resources, really. Um, I've th some of you might have seen this picture before because I've seen it kind of on blogs and on Twitter and everything. But um, I think this is one of the, 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 the ways we, we might need to kind of rethink um, uh, inclusion, our debate around inclusion. This, when I first saw this picture, I only saw these two pictures. I think and, um, it, it's kind of saying, um, you know, that if, if everyone, if you just distribute the resources a little bit more um, equitably, you know, um, then everyone's all right, everyone's a winner. Actually, it kind of shows you that the, the problem's elsewhere. You know, that there's a more systemic problem with the fence, you know, and maybe the, the, the discussion around resources. And certainly my experience this has been um, when we're talking about resources in SCN and inclusion, we very often end up talking about teaching assistance and a high amount of support from, from a TA. And I think that we can be thinking more about what we can do at sort of systemic levels, um, uh, you know, in terms of be you know, better teaching, um, uh, uh, modifying the curriculum assessment procedures and so on. Uh, you know, perhaps deal with the resources issue, but actually kind of look for those systemic barriers as well and try to kind of remove some of those. Okay, so, so who wants to go next? I've actually forgotten what my question was. Uh, <laughs> hang on. It was, um, does inclusion mean that all children must go to the same school? Thank you, Andrew, yeah. Um, uh, well, in terms of um, mainstreaming and integration, uh, that's the debate on that is, I think... Um, dates particularly from the early 70s when it was first put in law that every child had the right to an education and then every few years after that there'd be some kind of gesture um, towards the idea to um, dealing with uh, often it was just disability but uh, uh, later it was SEN uh, more generally and um, that went on for quite a few years and there was a lot there of differing interpretations, education acts that said, well, we should try and get as many uh, students with special needs into mainstream schools while also having a section saying we really need to value those special schools and not see them decline. Um, it really only took off, and the word inclusion really only became the central one in the late 90s. And at that point, there was this 10-year period of we want inclusion. You should understand that it means 
um, everyone goes to their local school, or at the very least, anyone, everyone goes to a mainstream school. And then by about 2007, that policy had pretty much fallen apart. It be, people began appreciating special schools, but also just how badly some students were being treated in mainstream schools that they couldn't cope with. Um, and we had things like the author of the Warnock Report condemning her own report from the, from the 70s. Um, and th that was when political change happened. We also had um, at Lord Adonis been quizzed by a select committee about whether, it, whether inclusion meant reducing the number of special schools or not and contradicting his own department. Um, so I think it did mean that. If the question is, is that the right principle, um, it's, again, it's to do with that conflict between resources and stigma. Um, from a, a social point of view, you don't want to separate children more than you have to, but from a concentrating resources and expertise point of view, you want to pay attention to difference. Um, and I think, well, I think it was a harmful era when it was just assumed that the eventual aim is to get everyone into the same school. I think social engineering is not the point of education. I think um, learning is, and if that helps change society, well, that's a good thing, but the learning has to come first. And a student shouldn't be in a school um, where they won't actually learn or where they might stop others from learning. Similarly, people, sh students shouldn't be forced into a school where they're going to be particularly unhappy. Um, I think part of the problem now is perhaps it's too many extremes that you're either fully in mainstream or in mainstream with a bit of support or you're in a special school with classes of five or a PRU with classes of five. And I think there's possibly ne a need for provision that's somewhere in between, that's not fully mainstream and not, um, not fully special. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. I agree with Andrew, that last point. That's a bit... <laughs> but um, I actually think that more children should be in mainstream schools. So I do differ, probably, I think, for most of the panel here. Um, I think it is worth having specialist provision within a mainstream school. But I think then the child is part of the community. I think the child is integrated within the community and actually I think it is a social point that so I disagree with Andrew on that point um, I don't think they should all go to mainstream obviously I think there are some cases but inclusion can also be I worked in um, a residential school for children with autism um, and one of the children there before he came to that school lived his day in a, in a white room, a white padded room, because that's all he could cope with. So actually he went to a special residential school and that was a huge inclusion for him. However, in a mainstream school, I think we can actually have students um, that are currently in special schools. But I do think the specialist provision within those mainstream schools is very important. I don't want them bussed 50 miles away to go to school. It's not fair. Yeah, I, suppose, I think you, you raised that point, Jules, that inclusion within the school community is really important. I certainly have recognised that. Um, if any of you have read my blog, you'll know my eldest son has Down syndrome and he's been in both mainstream and special and he's far more included in the school community in a special school than he was or he would have been in a, main, in a big mainstream comprehensive. So I recognise a lot of what everything said. Now, um, we had a little conference and we decided if there were people who, in the audience who would like to pose a question, um, now's your chance. I do have more. Oh, we've got a gentleman here at the front. Uh, what do you think is the best way of measuring? Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello. <laughs> um, oh, teacher with a microphone. <gasps> what uh, What do you think is the best way of measuring whether inclusion's working? Then, uh, who would like to go first? Well, I'm I'm happy to say in our school, if they're if they our, our primary purpose is to get them to learn, and you know, so we do lots of various things. But my my biggest purpose is, are they learning? And because schools are for learning, I think Andrew would agree with that. Um, so if they're learning and in in a way and they're fulfilling their potential whatever that means then that's how i measure it if they're getting to the stage where they're hardly in classes at all they refuse to work with their ta they're um doing whatever they can to come out of that lesson then it's not working and that's where i need to come up with a plan with the teachers and the tas to see what we can do around that so for me it's inclusion within class and learning Kind of similar, but we've just taken a child on who is in year two, who was in a school who never had a class photo, was hardly ever in school, was and 
when he first came to us, we had huge behaviour issues, but now we have none. So in terms of inclusion, uh, quite often what happens, I find, is that, that, that we are trying to solve the problem by keeping that child occupied, but we're not really teaching. I think inclusion, if it, the way of measuring it is in learning. You know, we, uh, Nick Gibb, the lovely Nick Gibb wrote to me a couple of weeks ago to say he, that, that we will still use, your raise online will still have your SATS results for your specialist children because it's not fair because children in specialists can achieve. And I totally agree, but my line back is that I think we as schools can decide whether they can achieve or not, and you need to trust us on that one. I have got a child this year who was actually sat the SATS test. Um, but it's very unfair to, to put you know P4 children through a SATS test. Um, so I would say, in terms of learning, it's, it's it's measured. Interestingly, special schools themselves don't have to ha don't have a raise online. They they don't have that data measured. So, um, but we as a mainstream school do. So. Okay. I'd like to sort of take the. I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, answer another question if I could. Um, I th in order to, to measure it and to know we measure it, we need, to, I think, first of all, to value it. Um, you you know, you measure what you value, you value what you measure. So I think we that, that is probably the the, uh, um, you know, the the kind of preceding conversation. You know, how to to, to have that about uh, about how we value inclusion. That might give us some kind of sense of what we might need to measure and how we might need to measure it. Um. There is no way really to measure it. I mean, if it, if it is about students with SEN going into mainstream schools, we can count how many students in mainstream schools have been classed as having SEN, but that classification changes all the time. Um, I, I said about half my dissertation being on inclusion. The other half was on the, um, categories for SEN. And it, effectively, they're very often not evidence-based. Um, they don't really match up with what has been done in previous years or what psychologists would do or, or, or particularly what doctors would do. Um, it's constantly changing. You can't compare. You can't measure. Um, beyond that, the only suggestion on measuring really is you can at least look at a few academic outcomes and that's not going to give you a full picture of what's happening or what you want it to happen but at least you can say if we're doing this in the name of inclusion and suddenly students are learning less as a result that should be a red flag and I mean there were r reports that uh, I mentioned earlier about um, the research into um, TAs that, reali that revealed that some of the support TAs were providing wasn't helping um, there was another, some other research that showed school when they tried to measure the level of inclusivity of schools, it correlated with a small negative eff effect on results, e even controlling for the special needs. So I think um, you can say, you can sometimes use measure what's going wrong, but it, uh, an easy measurement that will just test how inclusive and how is it working, there isn't one. And there won't be until things stop changing every year. Yeah, yeah, and I think you can then call those grades into question. I mean, I uh, have we got much longer? We've got about uh, ten minutes. Oh, we got ten minutes. Okay, well, I w I'll tell you a short story. Um, I live in Gloucestershire, and I live very close to the National Star College, which is a specialist, I suppose you'd say, a higher education college for young people with quite profound learning difficulties. And I was very struck by the president of the students' union, his young man in an electric wheelchair, and he spoke to us as a group of students studying for the Senko Award, and he said, when I got here, I could not dress myself, and now I can. And that really spoke to me, both as a teacher and a parent, in that sometimes we do disempower children with the amount of help that we give them. And then a member of staff spoke, and she said something that affected me even more profoundly because I knew it really, but I kind of needed someone to say it, which was that they take a very different view at the Star College. They're completely independent, so they don't have any, any of the measures that we do in the main, mainstream or, special, or you know, state sector, which is that we work towards the day they leave from the day they start. And I think, for me, that's been most profound because sometimes I think, especially, I mean, I'm a primary person and I know we can get a bit lost in that. We might be working towards the day they leave our class, 
but we're not working towards the day that they leave. We're not working towards the day that they actually leave education. What are we doing to help those young people to live as independent life as they can? Sometimes, and I think quite a lot of the time, students with special educational needs and disabilities, their success looks different. It looks different to what we are expecting, and it looks different to how we want to measure. And it can be something as what we might take for granted, being able to dress yourself. So, shall we have one more question? Um, it's not really a question, it's more about this obsession with measurement. Uh, and I come from a quality background, so I'm okay with measuring things, but I think we need to be a bit sensible about it. In, in terms of inclusion, my, my feeling is that we almost forget that this is a community, and that actually we can walk around a community and we can observe who is, is part of that community and who's excluded. It, it, I, I think, I know you can't observe teachers, but I think that we can observe how the community itself functions and who participates and who feels comfortable and, and we watch the relationships and the dynamics there. Okay, thank you. Have we got time for, there's another lady at the front here. Hello, <coughs> just, um, I'm a parent and I'm just going to follow on from Brian, is it? Um, points about um, how you would make that decision or that call of whether a child could be included in your school. I, um, my son was in a year two, uh, P levels, he was P levels four or five, I think, and I tried to get him into a mainstream school at that point and they all absolutely refused um, to take him, said they couldn't meet his needs. I home educated for a year, a year, about a year and a half, and now he's in um, a mainstream school with a unit and he's actually he's in year four, he just got to the end of year four and he's academically equivalent to his peers now, a little bit lower in literacy, but still within the normal range. So I just wonder, when you're making those judgments, what is it that leads you to make those judgments? Because we, in, in my local, he does, goes out of borough, he goes to a maintained school in a different borough because they were willing to take him, but none of the local schools were willing. They said they couldn't meet his needs. And I just wonder, what, what is it then that, that enables you to make those kind of judgment calls? Because it seems to me very, very complicated. Um. Mm. I suppose it's the responsibility of being ahead. You have to, you know, ultimately you're the responsible one for taking that on. Um, you know, they're, they're, it's complex. There's the whole moral kind of conundrum. It's knowing your school, it's knowing your teachers and their feelings about it, knowing the stresses and strains in it. But ultimately, um, it's coming down to whether you think you can do it. I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm being fair to all heads here that you feel that you can do it or you can't. And you don't want to set someone up to fail. And you would say it face value they're saying I can't do this because I genuinely can't do it um, I would refute that quite often because until you try you don't know quite often but I think there is you know I, I talked about a fear you know I, I, I live or die well I don't die and it's not that dramatic but you know an Ofsted will be the difference between whether I carry on being old primary head or not um, so I make decisions daily on on that when you go over capacity in your school, and I find school leadership harder than it's ever been at any given time, when you're over capacity, you're in real danger of going downhill quick. And I think heads are forever trying to make those decisions, whether they're right or wrong. OK, we pretty much run out of time. OK, so I'm going to plug shamelessly. OK, this is my book, buy it, buy it, buy it, if you're a primary school teacher. And I'm also going to read you a paragraph from my blog. Um, inclusion is a funny thing. It's like a shadow. You know it's there, following you along. But when you want to, you can't seem to grasp it. You can reach out, touch the things it touches, feel its effect. But it isn't the sort of thing you can pick up in your hands and examine. It doesn't work like that. Unlike shadows or rainbows, there isn't a set recipe or a defined set of instructions. And boom, there it is, sitting in your hand. Instead, like the shadow and the rainbow, it slips further away with each further attempt to capture, capture it. You only really know it when you see it and when you feel it. Thank you. <laughs>